Good. Yeah, what episode are we now? No, 32, 33? 33. Wow. Uh, episode 33, uh, here with Coach Craig Bazia. Yep. Yep. Coach, thank you so much for coming. Uh, congratulations. Like I said, I don't usually get uh, – a little nervous for podcasts, but this one means a lot to me. This is cool. Uh, I'm I just being a, being around the the team the last three years, and because uh, this is technically your third year, right? Correct. Yep. And uh, and seeing the change, and I mean, what's happening in Crown Point has been awesome, and seeing the community rally around this program. Uh, <clears throat> but being able to sit with you is a, a huge blessing. So thank you for coming in. Thank you for your time. Um, and uh, yeah, we're we're a lot is happened in the last few weeks for you guys uh how you feeling at this stage well good we're just, just trying to wind some things down but I, I appreciate it. it's a pleasure being on and, and being able to talk about crown point football anytime we could do that we're never going to pass that up and and uh you know it's been one of those wild rides you know and and um you know i we get congratulated and we get patted on the back and and you know and I, I think everybody really happy with the destination that we that we ended up at in, in lucas oil but i i think Probably the biggest part for us was not so much the destination, but the journey. I mean, if you don't look back and look at the journey about where we were at, where we started, you know, three years ago, last year an undefeated team, we, we, you know, we get stepped up, you know, slipped up in, in the sectional, um, and then uh, you know this year coming back and and being able to do what we did, but be able to see the journey that these guys have been on is absolutely incredible. I'm just uh, sort of glad that they took me on the ride with them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, as a, I know I say this for a lot of people, but um, we're glad that you are here. Um, th- and I want to start a little bit in your background. Um, uh, where are you from Northwest Indiana mm-hmm. originally? Where yeah. are you from originally? Uh, graduated from, uh, Griffith in 1979. Nice. Um, from there I went to, uh, on a football scholarship to Eastern Illinois, stayed there for a year, um, transferred out of there to a little small school in, in the woods called, uh, uh Lakeland College, now Lakeland University yeah. up in Sheboygan. And I was able to go up there and play three sports, uh, you know, as a collegiate uh, athlete and, and graduated from there. And actually, uh, what some people don't know, my first head coaching job was a, uh, a basketball job. I was a head basketball coach at Elkhart Lake High School um, nice. at the age of 21 while I was doing my student teaching. And then, uh, you know, when I got done there, I uh, just decided I wanted to come back home and, and uh, had a few interviews. First person, I, first place I interviewed was Portage, and, and they hired me as a middle school uh Believe it or not, social studies English teacher. When I tell people that, they they can't believe it, but uh, they did. And then I, I eventually transitioned to uh, uh, PE about four or five years later, and, and I was at Portage for uh, a wonderful twenty four years. Wow. Well, when when was your time at Michigan City? You had a couple so, of three yep. years there, right? Yep. So uh, I believe two two thousand seven to two thousand nine. Um, I had a dear friend who was an athletic director at Bear Falls, and uh, he was he since passed away, but. He was calling me every single day. They had got a new superintendent that wanted to make football a, a, a big deal in Michigan City. And uh, for months, uh, he was he was texting. And I said, I'm good. I'm good where I'm at. And, you know, eventually they came up with a, a proposal that was very, very uncommon for high school coaches in Indiana. Uh, there was not, no teaching involved. There was just football. It was an administrative position. Um, huge pay raise for me and my family. It was sort of nice. very, very hard to turn down. And, and uh, you know, at that point, Michigan City was the doormat of the of the Doolin, right? And so we knew we had work to do. But I just felt like um, maybe that was my calling. Maybe, that, you know, enough was enough. I think at, at Portage, I probably did whatever I could do and let, let's move on. You know, I was either stay there for the rest of my career for 40 years or move on and, and sort of get re- reinvigorated, which I did. And we were able to turn that thing around in, in three years. And then about the, the middle of the last football season, a friend of mine who actually has some crown point roots, um, Ryan Pickock, who used to be the pr- principal here in – uh, Crown Point uh, had transitioned to be the head coach or the principal at Homewood Flossmoor. And me and him had a little bit of a relationship. He actually, when I was at Portage, he had asked me to come over as the AD at Crown Point. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I said, um, you know, I'm just not ready to get out of coaching. You know, I appreciate it. Well, we sort of kept in touch. And then when he went over there, he called me in the middle of the year and he goes, hey, I need you to be my football coach here next year. And I knew nothing about Homewood Flossmoor High School. Mm-hmm. Started doing the research and found out that. Pretty good, pretty good high school, right? Yeah. And a uh, ton of athletes, fluent area. Um, and, uh, you know, again, selfishly, um, they pay a little bit more than they do in Indiana, right? And mm-hmm. so uh, it was more of a, a lifestyle change for me as, as most as, as, a, as a job movement. And um, mm-hmm. uh, we went over there, and, and uh, I always tell people that I would never have been successful at HF if I didn't take the Michigan City job because it really – taught me how to tear a program down to the studs 
mm. and build it back up. That's awesome. And my first year at HF, we went uh, ten and three. They came off a one and eight season. They didn't make the playoffs the last two years, and we play. We were lined up to play uh, Mount Carmel in the semis to go to the state championship game. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I def I want to get in. I want to get into all that football. I, I'm curious as to you growing up right in Griffith. What was it like growing up in Griffith? How did you grow up? Did you have siblings? Did you have were your parents working? What, what was yeah. life like when you were growing up in Griffith? Yeah, and, and again, to be honest with you, it was very. You know, we were playing in a. a a city sort of like this. It was it was like Friday Night Lights, right? When I was at Griffith, and it, excuse me, it's changed since then. But uh, I had my my dad owned a liquor store. My mom worked any job she could. You know, we could you know paycheck to paycheck, obviously, and and uh, you know they gave us everything they could. But it was it was hard. You know, it was hard, and I think that's part of you know what made me who I am today. And and I had I had a brother who was. Uh, uh, a baseball player and, and uh, was five years ahead of me and ended up going to VU and play baseball and, nice. and uh, you know, two sisters. And, and so we just uh, did the best we can. My dad was involved in Babe Ruth and, you know, coached me in there but never was able to coach me in football or anything. And had a Hall of Fame coach in Les Thornton uh, who really shaped and molded me and, and made me to the person I am today and, and really made me want to be a, a head football coach because he was just – Older guy, but still uh, very enthusiastic. Loved the game, built relationships with kids, and, and and I think that he had a big impact on my my career. That was in Griffith. High that school. was in Griffith. Yeah. Um, what were you like in high school? Athlete, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. What were you like? So I was an athlete. I have three sports: um, basketball, baseball, football. Basketball, baseball, football. Nice. Started all three years in, nice. in all three. So I mean, I mean, it was I was at. I guess you know at that time there was there was jocks and there were hoods or whatever you wanted to call it right I was the jocks right um, you know I had a lot of a lot of guys that uh, you know were were the same as me uh, but I was that straight and narrow guy you know and, and again I always tell people that uh, I had every opportunity to go in my dad's liquor store and take a case of beer out and take my buddies out and go drink right and it just never appealed to me right and you know I was that straight laced guy that. You know, everyone else was going out after games, and I was going home, and just that's just the way I was, right? And uh, and I continue to be that to this day. I just just never been that. Not that I'm not sociable. I'm just not that that party guy, right? Yeah. And so so I was I was that guy that was just all about sports. And to be honest with you, and I tell our some of our guys that we have now that maybe are struggling in the school, uh, and I tell them all the time, like, listen, I didn't like school either. I really didn't. But I had to do it if I wanted to play athletics, right? At, athletics got me out of bed, not history class, not math class, right? But it's what we did. I mean, and and, uh, and I had a coach that was over the top of me and said, "Hey, you got to get this done, right?" And, and uh, so again, tr- uh, had a great career in, in Griffith and, and moved on from there. That's awesome. And um, so three sports. Which one did you have a preference? Uh, you which know, you I got asked that a million times, and, and the only thing I would say was. Um, I loved the one I was playing the most, Yeah, you know, and, and, and so with that being said, uh, went to Eastern Illinois on a football scholarship. It was supposed to be a football basketball or a football baseball scholarship. We ended up going to getting into the baseball season after the first year and, and, uh, the football coach calls me in and he goes, you're not going to be allowed to play baseball. I said, well, that's why well, that was a deal. He goes, we, we need you here. You're not, we're not going to allow you. Well, at that point I called my high school coach again and mm-hmm. said, I'm, I'm leaving. Right, I don't want to stay here. I want, you know, I, I really, I mean, I played it all my life, right, and and uh, and I understood, you know, the basketball piece, but I at least wanted to play too. Well, lo and behold, I, I transfer up to a little school in, in Wisconsin, Lakeland College, and and uh, I go up there and play football and um, play baseball, and and after my first year, we're in intramurals and we're playing, and I'm just playing like I, I can play, and I get a message to meet that basketball coach in 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 his office the next morning, and. Says he wants me to play basketball, you know. So uh, from that point on, I I, I lettered in four sports, or, nice. or three sports, four years in basketball, football, and baseball in, in college. And That's then, awesome. Uh, you know, after that, obviously, I for ten years I coached football, basketball, and baseball. So you're never going to find the proponent of multi-sport athletes more yeah. than me, just because I've lived it, right? You, yep. you, a lot of people talk it, um, and I I still think. There's a lot of people I know in our earlier conversation, you you said you had a regret, but I mean, I just believe that every kid should really exhaust all what they can do in high school, Yeah, you know, because you can't get it back. hundred percent. Like as, uh, and, and I grew up, what you just shared resonates a lot with me because my friends were usually the ones who I was trying to stop from doing dumb things. And I can't explain why I think it was just, 
I don't know why it was as a kid. I just didn't care for all those things. I mm -hmm. was always – all I cared about was sports, mm -hmm. basketball, baseball, football, and I played soccer growing up. And I was pretty good at those two that I didn't play in high school. And um, uh, the – my thought was – because basketball was my main focus mentally, I was like, I'm going to take the season before off and focus. And that was probably one of the worst things I mm -hmm. feel like I've ever done. Um, I would have loved to have played football, and I still wish that I did to this day. But uh, – I was grateful to play those two sports. Sure. Don't get me wrong. All four years at Crown Point, it was a huge blessing. Yep. It was one of the best experiences of my life. But uh, I completely agree. My only friend who currently – well, I have a couple friends who play professional level. Uh, however, the one who plays at the highest level played three sports. And it's pretty simple, right? I mean, there's a – we all know who Zach Plezak is, yep. and that's one of my best friends. Yep. And uh, uh, he played basketball, football, and baseball. And there's there's a reason I think he's at that level of being that level of an athlete and had a lot to do with cha challenging himself all year Absolutely. all year long yep. versus just you know and I understand the idea of focusing but you're like you said you lived it and now you're you've been coaching kids for thirty years doing this so yep. um, uh, what positions did you play uh, and yeah in, in uh, football I was a running back um, basketball I was obviously a point guard and then um, baseball I was a a shortstop throughout high school and then moved to outfield, center field when I was in, in college. I had that dream of, you know, going to all these camps and all these yeah. pro, you know, everybody and, and had that dream and, and uh, it didn't work out. But uh, mm -hmm. um, it was fun. And like you said, I, I think there's, you know, everybody wants to train all year round. Everybody wants to lift all year round. And I'm, I'm good with that. But there's something about competing in a sport that overcomes all that, right? I, I tell yeah. our players all the time, I, you know, if you want to go out and you have a passion for a sport, Go play it, right? I would rather ha you sitting on a free throw line and shooting a one-on-one -on -one to win the game than I would have you next to me in the weight room, you know, because it just pays off, you yeah. know, and, and uh, you know, or, or in the batter's box with a three-two count with a hit, you know. I mean, all that that stuff is so much more valuable, I think, than than training. And and I believe uh, I'll be honest with you, I think a lot of kids overtrain now. You know, they're going to their personal trainers, they're doing this, they're doing that. I think they get bored. Um, you know, and I, I think they're ch chasing some some pie in the sky dream, and it, it just it's just not there. And it takes away it takes away from the uh, the experience of the competition and the sport because you're like like you, I, I know kids now, or I guess I have friends who have kids, and they're seven years old and they're training one thing all year. It's like it's beating the kid down, man. Like I remember as a kid, we just played wiffle ball all day long when we weren't at all star yep. practice, and then we'd go back and play. It was just constant competition yep. to freaking beat that other guy and yeah. i think that's how i got the way that i did is because i yeah i loved winning but i absolutely hated losing yeah and so we were constantly competing and playing and i i, I agree with the overtraining thing but you live you know that way more than me i just feel like i see it uh now with kids it's like you focus on one thing and i well, i don't it, love to see that I don't and it's know. probably why you're successful in what you do now right just because 100%. of the competition and you've learned it and, and and if anybody doesn't think there's a carryover for what kids are doing in high school it just it, it really does break my heart, and, and Alex, you said it, uh, to see parents drive these kids, six, seven, eight-year-old kids, to, to training and this and that, and, and you look at the kid and you go, is he really having fun, or is this for the parent, right? And, and, I, and I know that's a hard thing to say, and parents don't want to hear it, but it's reality. Sure is. It, it's reality, and, and let, let kids be kids, right? I mean, it's okay to guide them, but, you know, like you said, you, you play wiffle ball, right? I mean, how many times do you ever drive around these areas right now and see kids playing pickup games? I, t I tell you what, I I'm we live. I love our neighborhood and where we're at in town, and I I'm seeing it more. Like our, our neighbor kids will come knock on our door, say, "Hey, can your daughter come play?" Can, and I'm seeing more of these kids just running mm -hmm. around, and it is awesome yep. because they are out. You know, we've got this this big patch of like a couple acres across the street from our house, yep. and they're out there all the time now. But I felt like the last ten years before, and now I notice it because I have kids, but. I agree with you. It's like when I grew up, that's all we did. Yep. We rode bikes to somewhere to play, and we played all day long. Yep. And we play, and we competed. And, you know, again, I mentioned Zach. And that whole group of friends that I had, that's all we did all day long. Yep. Wiffle ball, outdoor pickup games. We'd go to, you know, we'd go to Wall Street Park, like everywhere, just play whatever sport that we could. Yep. And beat the crap out of each other and get better. Right. And, like, and, again, it's it's – uh, I agree with you though. You do not see it nearly as no. much now. The days so. of strikeout, where you put the the, the square and the X on the, <laughs> yeah, on the oh, building yeah. and all that, oh, yeah. I mean, and, you're, and you're looking to tape up a ball just to get another ball. I mean, yep. you know that has value. Yeah. You know, and, and I know you know I don't want to sound like that old ogre guy. You know, when we were that, you know, but I, I I just believe it has value and and yeah. um, it's a different world we're living in. Yeah. That's for sure. The uh, you you referenced the coach that you had 
Uh, was that in high school at Griffith? You yes. said a Hall of Fame coach. Hall of Fame coach. What yep. was his name? Les Thornton. Les Thornton. Yep. Okay. And what what was the impact that he had on you? More so mindset wise. Like how, how did? Because obviously, I would assume that Les's relationship to you as a coach has an impact on you as a coach now, or maybe is the reason why you became a coach. What what, what was it that kind of led you early on to start to think, hey, maybe I do want to be a coach? <clears throat> well, it was one thing to play for him. Um, and again, when you're playing for him with 40, 50 other guys, right? But you just sort of see his enthusiasm, his passion for the game. Um, but what really struck me was uh, when I was, you know, alluding to that story back when I was looking to transfer, my dad could not take off work. My mom could not take off work. Uh, there was a coach when I came in to talk to my high school coach uh, when I wanted to transfer. They just happened to be from Lakeland College and he was visiting. And he said, hey, we'll, we'll take care of you. You know, my coach would talk, talk to him about him about me, and he said, we'll take care of you. And I go, coach, I don't have any way to get down there. He goes, we need, we need to get this guy tomorrow. The semester starts the next week. And 5 o'clock in the morning, he pulls up and says, let's go. And pu- puts me in his that? old 90, 98. We're going through five feet of snow. I mean, it's a blizzard. We get him there. And not only does he take me there, but uh, he negotiates for me with the admissions. And uh, – Essentially, he said, hey, this kid was on full scholarship at Eastern Illinois. He's not paying a dime to go here. And I remember uh, these people coming back like a car, used car salesman. And before we knew it, they were giving me money to go to that school, right? And, wow. and, and it was like that was the impact. Like, and I talk all about this all the time. I, I mean, I, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to go and be inducted to the uh, Indiana Football Hall of Fame last, last spring. And that was one of the things I talked about, about the impact a coach could make on somebody like that, and that just was vi- that spoke volumes to me. This guy had no reason just to you know pick me up. Let's go going through a snowstorm, and and be honest with you, if he didn't do that, I would not be here today. Wow! Because I would not not have gone to that school. I would have been looking for another place. Who knows what would have happened? Maybe not even gone to school, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's the impact that he made on me. So when you were playing, were you thinking, okay, I want to play at the next level after college? I want to play at the next level, or were you thinking at that point? coaching what was your what was your thought at that time I mean your thought was probably just playing but it, at the it, same time. it was it was well I I had three tryouts uh, when I got out of school with the Cowboys Packers and a team in the USFL um, so uh, obviously it didn't work out um, baseball was another dream of mine and, and uh, just didn't work out so at that point you know when I was doing my student teaching uh, this job opened up my athletic director from Lakeland called and said hey there's a job open up you're interested in getting into coaching I said, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm interested. And at that point, I think I knew, like, my playing career was over, even though I continued to play um, semi-pro baseball for another 10 years, uh, oh, even nice. even out here, if, if you remember, like, uh, Crown Point Chiefs, yeah, the yeah. Samanos and all those, you know. Yeah, that, oh, I yeah. mean, so I played with those out here, and and uh, uh, I, I continued to do that, but got into coaching and got my first first year, and then I was 10 years as a – as a JV varsity assistant in football, basketball, baseball, Portage before I got the head job in 94. Okay, so then, all right, so we'll go there now. So you're at Portage. Um, how was the program before you got there or took over as yeah, head coach in 94? It was average. Okay. Um, you know, Portage at that point, um, you know, Merrill was a big deal. Uh, Valpo was a big deal. Um, you know, the Doolin was, was, had some big time coaches, right? I mean, uh, Don Hall and uh, Hobart was still in there as well. And, yeah. and, and so, uh, um, it was it was it was average. A dear friend of mine who just passed away. It was coaching with me forever. Bob Maddox uh, uh, was a head coach before me. I was his offensive coordinator. We were sort of like, uh, you know, go through, through through thick and thin. He decides to take a job again at Valparaiso University as assistant coach. It opens up. I'm the youngest of five applicants at Portage. Uh, I'm 31 years old at that time. There's several guys on staff that had been there for 25 years, 30 years. Um, um, prior to me getting there and uh, we go through the interview process and I'm selected to be the coach. And, and uh, wow. so at 31 years old, I'm the head coach at Portage high school, which now it's not that big a deal back then to Portage was, I think about the sixth biggest high school in the state to, for a younger guy like that, having his first job because at most times you have, you have to work your way up, right? You have to go to a one, a school. Then you got to maybe go to a three, yep. show you can do it. I decided just to stay there in hopes that, uh, you know, when the opening uh, came about, I was able to be selected, and lo and behold, I was. You hopped right into a 5A school, 
And the first year as a head coach, you went to state championship. First year, we go undefeated. Yep. And wow. we, uh, the year before, Lake Central had gone down to the Dome. I call it the Dome because that's what it was at that point, the RCA yeah. Dome. Uh, Lake Central had gone down to the Dome. They, they had lost to Bloomington South, Rex Grossman. Um, people know that name. And they brought everybody back. I mean, Lake Central was lower. They were the number one team in the state. And that was our first opponent that week. <laughs> so people are looking, why do you want to take this job for, dude? Like, what are you doing, right? Um, and we uh, – you know, I, I I knew where the Portage program could go. I knew the type of kids I was dealing with. And, I again, I sort of took it down to the studs. Even though I was in the program, I knew it was just floundering. It was just five and five, six and four, you know, four and five. It just, I, it just wasn't all about that. So um, I turned it into essentially a boot camp, you know. And, and I have some really, really dear friends that were on that team that I continue to talk about. And they talk about, I mean, it was, we went from about 100 and, 20 in the summer, and I think we started our first game at 52. And uh, wow. I just wanted to find out who's in it and who's not, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't want to find out on Friday nights who was going to buckle on me. And so we put them through a boot camp, and we put a, um, a path together, an obstacle course, and these guys still talk about it now. But, you know, it, it was if I was going to do it, I was going to do it my way. I knew I had some really hard-nosed kids in Portage that would accept it. Some wouldn't. But, uh, you know, uh, a lot of Portage kids, a lot of South Haven kids, I mean, those kids were tough kids, you know. And, and uh the kids that stayed uh, uh, rallied around it, and um, we ended up uh, upsetting uh, Lake Central in the first game in and double an, overtime. And an undefeated season. And an undefeated season went right down to the dome. Ended up losing to Castle High School, um, but finished 13-1, and one, yeah. Wow, awesome. And then, so you had 13 years of Portage, yep. right? 13 years. And you ended up, I think it was, what, 104 wins and maybe less than 30, around 30 losses, something Somewhere like that. There, yeah. So, I mean, when you when you take that as an average, though, it's an average of a 10-3 and three, ten and three season, that's a phenomenal high school season. From there, you had, you had already alluded to it, your Michigan City opportunity. Yep. Had three years there, turned that program around, and then HF reached out to you. You had mentioned that. Talk about the the – Talk about that that H that that opportunity you got at HF and and going over there what that was like over there. Yeah, um, again, not knowing much about it. Obviously, I had to do a lot of research on it. You know, before I took the job, I just had sort of blind faith in the guy who who reached out to me and, and the superintendent. Their superintendent there was a guy named Vons Man, Mansfield who played in the NFL. So I knew, you know, and I'll, I'll say this to anybody: the number one thing to take over a program if you're going to be successful is, is administrative support. If you don't have that, I don't care how good your players are. I don't care how good your coaches are. I don't care how big your community is. If you don't have administrative support, you're not going to get there. Mm-hmm. And so I felt like that was in place. That infrastructure that I needed was in place. Um, and then uh, obviously they were coming off a really bad season, a couple of really bad seasons. Prior to that, they had been really good, right? So I knew there was a possibility of getting there. Again, taking over for a couple teams, a couple of programs where I was able to just tear it down and bring it back up. I did really the exact same thing I did at, at HF. Now I'm dealing with a whole different clientele there. Um, and uh, I knew that. And, uh, you know, they were, they were, it was just different. They weren't used to doing things the coaches away, they were used to, the inmates were running the asylum. And, mm. you know, again, I had to step up. And I remember, you know, my first year, uh, I threw a kid out that was already committed to play defensive tackle at Purdue. Um, threw him out of practice three times. His dad came in crying. Oh, why are you throwing out my son? I said, because your son is not practicing hard. He's not practicing the way I want. I don't care where he's going. He's either going to get on board and practice the way I want him to practice, how everyone else is practicing, or he's not practicing. In, in the middle of that, at HF, there was uh, obviously something big that happened in your life. 2019, you got diagnosed with, uh, what is it, acute? I don't want to explain. Acute uh, by load leukemia. Wow. And, yep. and uh, uh, someone released a great documentary on your story. Um, I, I watched that documentary and uh, just recently, last night. And, um, I, I mean, you went through what sounded like hell. Uh, it sounds like, I mean, but when you, when you were diagnosed with that shortly, I mean, not long before that, um, it was almost like a, a, essentially a, the most fatal form of leukemia, right? It is. Uh, it is right. So, um, and it's a, it's a cancer of bone marrow. Is that right? Bone it marrow. And, yep. Okay. Yep. Um, when, uh, uh, so 2019, what you're in your mid fifties at that point, like uh, early fifties, late, late, late fifties, late fifties. Yep. And so finding that out, um, what was your mindset going into that? Well, it was crushing, but uh, just to take you back a little bit, like we just finished our – we lost to Lincoln Way East in the uh, – I believe it was in the semi, so it was a game to go to the state finals. Lincoln Way East was a big rival. Yeah. I had not been feeling good for, for two weeks, fought through it um, like we're taught to do, right? Um, and then 
we lost in a close game in Lincoln East, and I just looked at my wife and I said, we got to go to the doctor. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't feel good. So we went immediately to the doctor. You know, at that point, we were, we were working at the hospital in Valpo, and, you know, we kept going back, and they kept saying, like, we we just can't find anything. It's just, just the flu and this and that. And finally, I just said, like, I've had the flu. This is not the flu, right? So to take you through the whole thing, I, I really mm-hmm. can't just because, number one, it's emotional. Number two, I don't remember a lot, mm-hmm. but I remember being in, in uh, Valpo community, whatever the hospital there is in, in Valpo, and finally someone came in and said, uh, uh, Mr. Bazia, we are transporting you to um, Northwestern University. You have leukemia. And at that point, like, we thought nothing like that, right? We, I mean, nothing. You know, we were like, what What are you talking about, right? And so I remember going in the ambulance and, and my wife riding in the back of the ambulance and she's begging to get in, you know, and they finally let her in. And, and from that point on, I, I just remember a few things and then obviously some things that were told to me. But... Um, um, they basically said, get the family here. Like, he, he's not going to make it, right? I mean, the odds are he's not going to make it. So um, they start talking about a transplant that I would probably need. But they had to make a decision whether they're going to put me on um, dialysis or um, start the chemo. And thankfully for us, you know, again, I'm, I'm in the best hospital, in what I consider the best hospital in the world, right? I mean, with these people at Northwestern. But they decide to uh, uh, forego the dialysis and let's try the chemo. And they gave me a, a form of chemo that was the highest you, you could get. And, and um, so for 45 days, I was in the hospital and, and uh, finally started coming around. And and uh, at the end uh, of it, they basically said, we don't see any more cancer in your body. However, there's a trace that we're picking up from the um, biopsy. And uh, so... From that standpoint, uh, we had to make a decision whether we we're going to just live my life the way it was. And the doctor was flat out, with, flat out, straight with me. And she said, "It's going to come back. Like, set your goals. Like, what are your goals? Like, you want long term? You want short term?" At that point, my daughter was Brittany was going to be getting married uh, coming up, and I'm definitely wanted to see her walk down the aisle, you know. And that was going to be a while, so um, we battled it back and forth and the only way that I was going to live a normal life was to get a, uh, a donor, a stem cell donor. Um, and, um, they found a match. Now it was a matter of if I was wanting to do it or not, because there are some severe, um, setbacks that you could get by having this, um, stem cell transplant, you know, whether it's lose your sight, I mean, you know, you go on and on. Right. Um, and so I could just remember, uh, we were playing golf uh, at Valparaiso Country Club, me and my wife, and I'm not a real good golfer anyway, but, I mean, I, wouldn't, I, was, I, I was swinging and missing the ball. And yeah. she said, listen, we got to figure this out. Like, we got to give them an answer tomorrow. Well, obviously, I, and uh, I said, and I was feeling great. You know, I was feeling great from the chemo. Mm-hmm. And uh, I go, why, why do I have to go through something that's going to make me feel so bad for a while when I feel so great right now? And I did. I felt great. And... Uh, and she just simply looked at me. She says, "Because you're going to die. You'll die, and I don't want you to die, and your family doesn't want you to die." And uh, at that, this is at that point, we we left and picked up the phone and told the doctor, "We'll we'll do the transplant." And uh, so it was a rough rough time of doing it, and uh, was in the hospital for an extended amount of time, and and uh, even came home, and um, unbelievably, I, I got a. Uh, a donor that was 18 years old um, that was a, a perfect match and uh, I sit here and I talk to you today because of him when I uh, I I was going to leave HF and so I put it in for early retirement four years prior to that so I knew when I was leaving well the year before I was leaving uh, that's when I was diagnosed with with leukemia well they I was able to, to coach that season go through what I needed to do and then they moved their season to the spring, and uh, I was able to coach that season all along with battle and leukemia, so I never missed a, a, a game, never missed a practice. Well, during that January is when the Crown Point job came up. We still had, I still had to stay at HF for the remainder of the year, which included a football season in the spring. So I got hired in January for the Crown Point job. So I had to put a staff together in January, for Crown Point, 
which I did. I had to get the weight room going again, which I did. I had to have all kinds of meetings, which I did. And then in March, I had to start a new season over at HF. HF. <laughs> so essentially, I was coaching two, two football wow. teams, still battling and recovering from leukemia, and then uh, finished up in, uh, in May of uh, – in May, and, and then came over, and, and uh, we really got a real late start, obviously, for Crown Point, you know, in that first year, but we were able to fight through a five-and-five five season, and then when we were ready to get everything and, and, and get everything that lined up that we needed to do, we had, we've had we had two uh, really remarkable seasons after that. The, uh, real quick, uh, the biggest thing that I kind of took away from your leukemia battle was when um, was when the, the transplant happened, and your, your wife had shared in that, which um, – your your wife, like you had mentioned, like the 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 support from your wife, both on football, but also in everything that you guys have gone through, yep. seems incredible. And I love seeing her posts on crumpling football pages, and all it's awesome. Because um, my wife is, without a doubt, the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Um, and uh, and she's, you know, I kind of feel a relation to that as far as the support side of things. But uh, when when she said that visiting hours were 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and from 6 p.m. on, you were by yourself in that room yep. going through that transplant. Um, I, again, the, I, I don't want to take you back to this, but I, I, the reason that I like to bring this stuff up is just because you went through one of the hardest battles of your life, going through probably the hardest times of that battle by yourself after 6 p.m. What was, what was, like, what was your mindset when you're going through? <clears throat> I saw the, the pictures of the sores in your mouth, wow. and I saw that. What, uh, what, what was your mindset? And how do, you, how do you maintain such a strong mindset to get through? Because I firmly believe that health and succeeding through, yes, there are things that are out of our control, and that's, that's my opinion, God's plan. But I also know that there's a severe link to uh, fighting disease and fighting uh, 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 and good health that is connected to that mind-body connection to the way that you see these things um, and the way that you view these things. What was your mindset going through that brutal time? And yeah. how the hell did you get through that? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, i just take it back a little bit. My first time I was there, um, it wasn't COVID, and my wife, Barb, slept on that little thing that they have in a hospital for 45 straight days, never left. Um, never left home. I never left the hospital. And then the second time, uh, you know, when we went, um, it was COVID, and you couldn't have visitors at all. That was part of the reason why uh, we were thinking. I, was, like, I just didn't want to go through that. Well, luckily they changed. They changed the rules, and, and uh, we could only have one person at a time. So usually it was my uh, it was Barb, and then my my daughter Brittany um, would would take turns and 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 come up together. But um, from six o'clock at night to you know the next morning. Um, I was on a leukemia floor, right? And so one of the things that you had to do is you had to walk. I mean, you had you had to get out of bed and you had to walk. I mean, that was part of it, right? And so you put down how many laps you did on the floor. But as I was walking, um, there were 24 beds or whatever, you got to see some guys, people that were going through the same thing you were, right? Uh, a lot of it wasn't pretty, um, but you got to build some relationships with people and talk and a little bit. And, and when I was on the, the downside of mine and ready to get out of there, I would, I would make it a point to stop in and talk to someone and say, Hey, I, I've been where you are, you know, you can make it right. I'm, I'm leaving in three days or whatever, you know, just to give them a, some encouragement. Right. Um, but, uh, the worst part of that was getting up the next morning and hearing all the sirens go off at night. And when you walked, you saw the people that you knew and you saw their bed was not made anymore and so and that would happen more times than not you know and and, and so you know, I remember a couple of times calling my wife and to say listen man I I, I this is rough I'm I, I someone else just died someone else, you know and it was just it was it was something that uh you know it certainly made you stronger but I mean I know it's you're talking about life and you're talking about athletics but you asked how I went through it and I I still believe that Competing in athletics had a lot to do with it. And everybody would talk about my positive, you know, like, everybody, did, did you think about dying? Now I get that all the time. Were you worried about dying? And my, my response was, I'm not worried about dying because I have too much to live for. Like, I'm getting out of here. And again, going back to the su support, having your pills, you know, whether you're taking 50, 75 pills a day, having those things at the right time in the right containers and taking them and all that type of stuff, we did exactly what we were supposed to do. And not that that would have made the entire difference, but 
uh, you know, I, I was to me it was a competition. Like I'm, I'm getting out of here. You know, I had to sit up there and, you know, these guys have all these big boats. What do they call that place in Lake Michigan? Um, where, all, where they're, I wish I could remember what they're called, but my my room looked right down on Lake Michigan, where all the people have all these big boats and they're having to, and they're rafting and they're doing all this type of stuff, right? And you talk about hell, right? Watching that for two months of just watching people. Never got a, never, ever got out of the room to get fresh air, ever. You know, and even to the point where I had people try to advocate for me. Can he just take a walk outside? Nope, couldn't take a walk outside, you know. Because so I'm seeing all this, and it was just a matter of a mindset. Like, I, I'm I'm getting out. And um, lo and behold, I got out. It was never a question. Not in my mind. Exactly. Not in my mind. I never thought about it. Never. We never talked about it. We never talked about what's going to happen if I don't get out. Never. Never talked about it. It's amazing. Um, and now, how do you feel? <laughs> Feel good. Uh, you look great. I, I, well, every every day is a good day. You know, I tell everybody that. Um, you know, every time you get up, it's a good day. You know, I, I got unfortunately, unfortunately for my players, like like they'll come up to me with a little injury or something. And go, you're ta- you're talking to the wrong guy, dude. <laughs> like you're talking to the wrong guy. Like you need to go. You know, talk to your mom. You know, I get a coach. I get it. Okay, all right. Like, um, but uh, I feel good. Obviously, a long run. Um, you know, worn out. A little bit, but uh, you know we'll take that every every year. How is facing death and beating it? How has that changed your perspective day to day? Not just as a coach, but like in your life, your family, your kids. Yep. Like, how has that changed your viewpoint? Just try. I, I always try to find a positive um, moment. You know, if someone says something, my I guess people get probably get tired of hearing me say, but I always say it could be worse, right? Like I'm, I'm dealing with a little cold right now, right? I mean, you know, my wife, you got to get you know the urgent care. It's like, hey, I've been through worse. Yep. You know, I mean, you know, and, and, and so it, it gives you a perspective like it, everything could be worse. Right. And, and, and so, um, you know, pick up yourself, tie your shoes up and put your hard hat on and go to work. Awesome. Um, now, what you shared before we were on, uh, you had uh, you had mentioned something you had heard about a podcast. This relates going to, the, mm-hmm. to Crown Point. Um, you know, at that point, you had just beaten cancer, gone through leukemia. Um, you had an idea of a deadline with HF, hear about the opportunity for Crown Point, and you had shared, too, kind of that quality of life. Um, it, talk a little bit about that and your decision to move to Crown Point, because I think I had read something, too, that said the only position you'd take in Indiana, again, was here. So how did the stars align for that? And then talk about how that, you know, going through <clears throat> leukemia and battling that led you here. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, um, I guess on a couple fronts, um, I, I knew I was leaving um, HF. I'd put in for my early retirement four years prior to that. So um, leukemia threw a whole different wrench into the whole thing. But regardless, um, I knew I was retiring. Really had no idea what I was going to do. Um, I had come to a Crown Point football game with one of my assistants, uh, Coach Tom Cicero, who had his son playing during that COVID year where we weren't playing. And I came and, and – uh, uh, obviously, I had coached against Crown Point several times, but I came and I just like looked and I just saw sort of like the potential. It was their homecoming, right? But when I was sitting up on the bleachers, like nobody's watching the game. You know, it was like people came and they weren't watching the game. Like there was no, there was no atmosphere, right? And and so that sort of stayed in my mind. And then um, when I was again finishing up at HF, I knew I had another semester or semester to go. The Crown Point job opened up. And um, I had thought maybe I'd take a year off. I thought maybe I'd go down to Florida. I had a couple opportunities there to coach and just, oh, nice. you know, just, just be an assistant, right? And, and right off to the sunset and do what we need to do. And I hate cold weather. Uh, you know, you know, and figure out how can I, how can I coach and still go down to Florida, right? Well, you can't do it as a head coach. Yeah. But many assistants do that, right? And, and so um, one thing led to another, and, and athletic director Bill Durrell and I, uh, we connected and um, – he just said, hey, can I come over? And um, now this was – I wasn't in the best of shape at this point, right? I mean, I was pretty frail at that point, but I, I was given the go-ahead to continue to go back to teaching at HF. And and he came in, and I think – I don't know if Bill would admit it, but I think he just wanted to see – obviously, Bill and I knew each other for a long time. right? He was head coach of Chester, and I was head coach of Portage at that time. And, you know, we've known each other and respected each other. But um, so <laughs> – he came in, and I think he wanted to see how I looked. Like, you know, because all the word was out, like, yeah, Coach Buzz is dying, right? Well, you know, we don't publicize what's going on in our lives, right? And they don't know where I'm at. So so he came in, and we started talking for, I'll bet you we 
we talked for three or four hours. You know, my wife came down a little bit, but for the most part, it was just me and Bill talking about, you know, what my what my vision was and how I thought I could do it, and and um, and uh, what their vision was and where they were going to go with it. Asked him about his administration. You know, as I told you, how important it was. And uh, you know, before we know it, um, um, you know, he called me up and said, "You're you're going to be our next football coach." And we went through a, just a mock interview and and uh, um, took me to the school board and away we were. But uh, to answer your second question, one of the things that uh, you know you had mentioned that I had moved to Crown Point in um, in July. Um, we we built a house and and we, we the drive even though we were still in Hobart. Um, it was just 35 minutes, you know, and, and so for some reason, again, timing's everything, right? There was nothing on in sports radio, and I turned the dial, and I heard this guy talking about QLR, and I have no idea what QLR is. So I just started listening, and he starts talking about quality of life remaining, and uh, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And well, at that point, I started, like, doing the math, and, you know, 45 minutes here, 45 minutes back. Sometimes I'm doing it twice a, t- twice a day. My wife's doing it at least once a day and sometimes twice a day. And uh, at that point, we decided if we're going to continue doing this job, we're going to, we're moving to Crown Point. Well, at that point, um, there weren't a lot of a lot of opportunities to move in Crown Point, as, as you well know. I mean, there sure. was, I mean, there was a lot it was of a we, tough time. Yeah, and uh, so we decided to build, which we have, and we're very, very happy to be here. And, and it's probably the best move we've made. That's awesome. Yep. And all right, so let's talk about Crown Point um, program wise. So first real full season without coaching two teams. Yep. Uh, you end up going undefeated regular season, like you mentioned, kind of slipped up in sectional game, which was definitely a heartbreaking one. However, uh, I mean, two, three seasons technically here, but two full seasons. I mean, we're 25 and six in our last, well, what, for our, we've won every p- regular season game. Correct. Completely undefeated in regular season. Yep. Um, obviously, we had our first state title opportunity last week. Right. Um, what, you you've done this at three different programs, okay. First off, I've, I've shared this already. Um, going to the games and feeling the atmosphere again is awesome. Um, I uh, I grew up. I remember being sixth, seventh, eighth grade. I think some guys, a uh, couple couple of the guys I remember who played at that time, and they were pretty good. When I I think it was like maybe I don't know, oh five, six, seven, eight around that timeline. There was a pre- couple pretty good teams there, and it was cool to see. But the last two years, seeing stands packed, no matter what the game is, feeling the atmosphere is entirely different. You've done this at uh, really four programs. Um, as a leader, I, I firmly believe that the, the most important thing in any organization, whether it's a team, it's a, a business, it's whatever the that that group is, leadership is the single most important aspect to leading to success. Whatever success looks like to you, whether that's that's business and financial success, that's winning and changing a program, You've done it here in a very short period of time. You've done it. You did in Portage your first year. You've done it everywhere. You did HF your first year. What are some of the leadership principles that you live by and lead with? And how are you? How have you been able to do this everywhere that you go as a leader? Well, I think first and foremost, you got to surround yourself with some really good people. I mean, I'd be kidding myself. You know, again, I get a lot of the credit. Um, everywhere I've gone, I've surrounded myself with really, really good. Uh, people, I told the people at the banquet, the only thing that I've been able to do was I've been smart enough to hire some really, really good assistant coaches, right? And uh, when you're in it, as long as I am, I have been, you you do build up a network, you know, and, and now it's a matter of do they respect you enough to come. And I've been, wherever I've been, I've been able to talk people into coming and, and doing that. So, you know, it's it's really about the assistant coaches, but I, I think uh, more than anything, you got to have a plan and you stick to the plan. And, and uh, you know, I, I lay my blueprint out and this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. And, uh, you know, when I came to Crown Point, I did the same thing at HF. I did the same thing in Michigan City. Uh, you know, when I came to Crown Point, I took every person that wanted to be a coach at Crown Point, and I met them down in my basement, and I met with them for a half hour. And just sort of felt them out. They needed to see what I felt. And then at that point, I needed to make a decision if I thought they were going to be, I don't say worthy enough, but fit into my plans, right? And uh, so I remember interviewing 30-some coaches, you know, from middle school up because I was going to put the people in where I needed to put them where I thought they would make the best difference. And don't ever undermes- underestimate your, your feeder system. You know, you got to have the right people at eighth grade. you got to have the right people at ninth grade. You know, it's not just about the people at the varsity level. And so um, there were some people that I, I felt really good about, and we got on our staff, some Crown Point guys that have been there forever, some Crown Point grads that have been there forever. And there were some I didn't feel really good about, and I just said, you know what, I don't think it's going to work out, right? Um, put your plan together. You stick to your plan. 
And uh, your coaches need to stick to your plan because sometimes, you know, they got to buy into what you're doing. And if you don't get the buy in, they can't be with you, you know. And, and, and I'm not about being liked, right? I got enough friends. I got, I got many contacts in my phones I could call, right? Uh, I always thought about it like if everybody likes you, you're not doing your job. That's how I felt, and I've always felt like that. And that probably goes back to the high school, like, right? You, they wanted to go here. I, I didn't want to do that, right? I didn't care. Um, and that's how you have to be. And, and then you you put a system in place, and, and uh, you, you, you go to work. And, and uh, you know, our, our, our slogan this year was never outworked, and that's been my slogan forever. Um, I'm never going to be outworked by the person that's across the sideline from me, ever. Um, Might have led to me being sick. You know, who knows? Because, I mean, you, sure. you wear yourself down. Um, that's just the way it is, but, um, that's just the way, what it is. And then I think once your coaches get around you and see how that you're not afraid to do anything, I think they're going to hop on board as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't micromanage my guys. Um, I don't scream and yell at my guys on the field. If there's something that needs to be said, I bring them inside and we're going to talk about it. Right. We're going to be direct. Um, I'm not a beat around the bush guy. There's not a lot of gray area with me, but I think probably the most important thing you can do in building a program and building a business is you have got to build relationships, positive relationships. And I think that's probably the one thing that uh, um, I do that um, I feel so strongly about is our guys got to know that I care about them, but they got to know they're going to get coached hard. And I'm not going to – their, their parents – can sugar coat it all they want, right? They're not going to get that from me. I'm not pat them on the back. We're going to know when they're doing well. But we're going to coach them hard. You know, I, we have a saying in our staff, coach them hard, hug them later, right? I mean, that's the way it is. Like, we're going to coach them on the field, and then after practice, we're going to give you a hug and say, hey, you can do better. You understand why I did what we did. But I think building relations is the number one key to, to putting together any type of program. That's awesome. The, um, when I think of all the best coaches I have, they were the ones that did exactly that. Like, um, I had a great – couple great coaches growing up I went to St. Mary's in Crown Point growing mm -hmm. up and uh one of my basketball coaches uh Mr. Toporski um it's just an example right one of those guys that like he was constantly yelling at me I mean at that time I was the best player on the team I always got grilled but then afterwards it was that it was that more one-on-one -on -one type of conversation but he knew how to get the best out of me yep I think that that's what um I, I say this a lot our team hears it all the time Noah's heard me say it a lot I know that my dream job is to be a head basketball coach that is 100% my dream job. However, I just wanted to learn financially to put my family in a position with business to the point where it's like, if I am just a basketball coach, I, I have options with finance, and then I can I could do this. That yep. was kind of my thought, right? And it's still a huge goal of mine. The best coaches I ever had found a way to get the best out mm -hmm. of each and every individual. Um, and the worst coaches I've had did not do that, right? And um, um, so what – you had mentioned, you know, never outwork, right? And now was we saw that all year long, NOW with, with Crown Point uh, in the program. And then also, like you said, uh, uh, coach them hard, hug them later. Um, the, uh, some, so those are kind of some of your main principles as far as coaching Absolutely. goes. Absolutely, yep. um, And is that maintained, has that developed over time? Did you kind of have that from the beginning and that's just stayed with you as a, as a value and a principle? Yeah, I think the same? values and the principles have stayed the same. I, I think I, awesome. I, I coach different now. Um you know, I grew up in the, again, for lack of a better word, the Don, <laughs> Don Hall area, yeah. era. And when, when, you know, you grab kids by the face mask and you and they understood, you know, and it, it was acceptable, mm -hmm. right? Um, you sort of find a way to get your point across a little bit more. You know, I, I probably was more of a yeller, or a screamer, all that. I mean, now, you know, you, you sort of, you, you just got to relate to kids, right? I mean, you got to change a little bit, right? And, but my principles haven't changed. You know, and how you get it across, I think, might have changed, but my principles haven't changed. I, I believe in what I believe, and, and but I do think you have to, uh, you know, you have to roll with the changes. I mean, it's, it's a different it's a different era right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, social media has is, is crept in to the point where, like, it's it's uh, it's something that has to be looked at, you know, and you have to be, you have to understand it's here, right, and how you're going to do it. I mean, I, I believe one of the things that we did, um, and you've probably seen it since I took over. Is we we put a we got a big social media presence. Heck yeah! And the only reason why I thought that was important is because nobody, in my opinion, was talking about Crown Point football. Yep. Like it was just they talked about football in August, right? Yep. And we needed this to be a you know 365 day people talking about. So we, yeah. we're always putting things on social media, right? And it helps our kids, it helps our community. And uh, one of the things that when, when the, the school board asked me, you know, like. like you know, what are your goals? I said, my goal, my number one goal is to make Crown Point football on Friday nights a community event. And that's how we're going to do it. 
and I think we've we've done job it. done. Yeah, let's keep going. That's the idea. That's, that's awesome. Yep. Uh, future of the program. What is, what's your vision for the future of the program? You just mentioned one thing right there. In Crown Point, we're talking about Friday. On Friday, we're talking about football. <coughs> um, but because there's a big difference between you got a few years that are going well, and this is a program. Ben Davis, that's a program, right? Like we we saw that, and you in. You know, but that's what their tenth state title. Right. You see, Center Grove. That's a program. It's yep. like it's a culture, right? And no matter who the head coach is, that continues to roll over. So, uh, like that was their first year head coach, right? Correct. So that again, that's there's that doesn't happen on accident. Um, and I, I, this is kind of in the conversation I've been having with people is like, uh, Crown Point has everything in its, everything is on our side to have a legit actual program that goes on for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and I know that that's how you think, just talking to you already. It's, it's not just short term. So what are some things, um, I think you've already mentioned a few of them as far as mindsets and principles, but um, what's kind of the vision of the program and uh, uh, your thoughts there moving forward? Well, I, I think, number one, you could get really lost in the wins and losses, right? And, and uh, nobody's happier than what we are able to accomplish. And, and But, you know, the program – is the program like we we have to build this thing and continue to do what we're doing and sometimes you know the odds of us going 13 and one and going to the state finals every year is not really good right i mean right. that can't that it, it could be the goal but we can't be disappointed if it doesn't happen i mean look look what we did we, we beat we beat lafayette jeff we went on the road we beat, beat penn we beat westfield uh, who's uh you know been in the state championship yeah. for the last seven years you know i mean would i like to do that every year yes i, I would but there's more important things to do, right? And, and it's all about getting our kids and, and, and our community together and rallying around and getting our guys understanding that, you know, what's important, take these life lessons and what we're doing, let's, let's move on. Our, our program's going to be in fine shape. I mean, we, you know, when I took over, we started bringing freshmen up to the varsity. That's never happened before. It doesn't usually happen in any 6A program, right? But I needed to go down and I needed to find some guys that I thought were pretty good athletes, and they would benefit by practicing with us on the varsity, and it would expedite our mm -hmm. growth, and it has. Yep. So our defense this year was number one ranked defense in the state at the end of the year, and we were starting four sophomores, yep. right? I mean, that, that's unheard of, yep. right? Um, never would have happened before, but because that was my vision of doing what we need to do. So we're going to continue to do that and grow. Um, you know, the one thing I don't want to do is – we have a really good group coming back, right? I don't want to put pressure on these guys and say, hey, if we don't take it one step further than what this group did, you're a failure. Yep. That's wrong. Yeah. Right? That's just wrong. Like, I, I mean, you tell me the only way we could get better is if we go down and beat a 10 time state champion in Ben Davis. Like, come on. Right? Um, so, it, to me, it's all about the process and what we're doing, what they're going through, how we're going to build this thing, um, the relationships we build. And uh, I would love to continue to do what we're doing. We're going we're gonna to try our best to do it. But that doesn't mean that our program is a failure, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think from our standpoint, we'd be disappointed if we're not competing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, each and every year for, for what we just accomplished. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would love to have another full hour. I do, I've do. i got a couple other questions. We'll wrap up here soon. Sure. But I, I, I feel like I could talk to you all day. Um, the, uh, um, I'll go a couple, couple of different directions. The uh, one thing that you had mentioned when you went to HF, you brought some of your assistants with you. You did the same thing here with Crown Point, I did. right? I think that that to me says a lot about a leader because um, I'm gonna I, I lead a very small group here, and there's 15 of us. Um, but I think one of the hardest things to do is to develop to the point as a leader where you you have high quality people like you said who they could go out and do their own thing. But for whatever reason, they do stay with you, right? And there's a lot of reasons involved in that, sure. right? Maybe they don't want to go through the amount of time and effort and everything you put as a head coach versus an assistant. You mentioned, hey, I could be in Florida and still right. be an assistant. Right. I can't do it as a head coach. Yep. Those are examples. But outside of that, it says a lot about somebody as a leader who you take all of these high-quality people and bring them with you. Um, and uh, that, that is what I had heard about when you came to Crown Point. It was like, he, it's not just him. There's, there's more that are coming with. And I remember seeing the coaching staff on the sideline first time you were here, and I was like, this is totally different. And it was awesome. Um, but uh, um, separately from that, as far as uh, you've been able to accomplish a lot as a coach, watching um, what 
the head coaches that I had the opportunity of being coached by at Crown Point go through as far as time and effort and energy into their their life and what they do. Um, how is it that you, obviously your wife, you had massive support. How is it that you maintain family life as a father, a husband? How do you integrate those two together to make sure that you're not just successful as a coach? Great question. I, I'm not, I just want to go back, backtrack a little bit to your first statement. Yeah. Um, bringing these coaches in like we did and, and we had five at 1.5 former head coaches. Yeah. That's um, what, yeah. I thought I had heard three or four, yeah. but five. Wow. Um, that's crazy. Don't let anybody kid you. Coaching matters. Coaching matters. And uh, there's different qualities of coaches. There's different, um, you know, types of coaches, but, but, but coaching matters. And, and I am so proud of what our assistant coaches do. I mean, they're absolutely phenomenal in how they do it. Going back to your second part of it is um, I think you got to strike a balance, right? I think you got to strike a balance. However, you know, just talking about my family, like uh, uh, I tell all our young coaches that are getting into the profession all the time, like I always ask, are you married? If you're planning on getting married, if you, you know, because they got to know what's ahead of them, right? If you're going to do this thing right, man, it's, it's, you, you can't just stick your toe in the water, right? And uh, so I always believe like, when you're married, there's only one or two ways it's going to work. Either that person that you're married to is totally all in for what you do. They're in. They're in with you. They're immersed with what you do. They, they, they're part of the program, right? Like we call my wife the director of football operations, right? That's probably a, a bad title for her because she does so much more. Um, but okay. she's in. She's all in, right? I mean, she's not at home like waiting for me and looking at her watch, like when I'm coming home, she's usually leaving with me, right? Or you got to tell your husband in August, hey, I'll see you in November. That's the only way it works. You can't work in the middle. You, I don't think you could have a relationship like that. And I've, I know tons of guys who've lost their marriages and lost relationships because of that, right? That balance, right? And I'm just very, very lucky. Um, I get to see my family. Uh, my daughter Brittany has been on. A, I don't know if she's ever missed a game. She used to be a ball boy, ball girl for me when I was in 1994. She never misses a game. That's awesome. um, you know, she's she's there. Um, I have a, a couple granddaughters, a couple grandkids uh, that they they're, they're around every once in a while from. Um, Ashley and, and Corey, who live in Crown Point as well. So, I mean, you get to see them, uh, but uh, I think they've been around it enough. They know. Mm -hmm. This is what we do, right? Yeah. This is what we do. And, and uh, I made it a point, you know, when I was growing up, like I was not going to miss anything of theirs. I was going to find a way to get there, right? I tell my guys all the time, my, my coaches, like, I give, hey, coach, my, my son's got his last pop water game. Go. Go, we'll figure it out here. Like, yeah. right? I mean, uh, got a dance recital. I got go. Right? Like, it's, nothing's more important than your family. Right? Yeah. Take care of it. And and uh, I think uh, guys respect that and, and and understand that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my uh, I, there's a very very smart man by the name of Tony Robbins. Many people oh, yeah. have heard of who talks about work life integration. Like, if you want to achieve anything at a high level, it can't be uh, like you mentioned. It can like you said. Hey, I'll see you. I'll see you in in November. Yep. Um, bringing your family involved in it like my daughter know like my daughter loves coming to the office my daughter knows you know she if you ask her what does daddy do for work daddy sells a lot of houses you know that i daddy. want to sell a lot of houses that's what she wrote on her like for her first day of school like that type of stuff it's it's the integration of of the f bringing them involved with it mm -hmm. like same thing like with our investments like my wife and i are involved in those investment properties and and making them look how we want and bringing them together and doing that together um, and integrating it together, making it all like a part of it is, yep. is one of the biggest keys. I love, like I, I mentioned this before, but I love seeing that. It's like seeing whenever I see Barb post something, I'm like, this is so cool. It's just that, that because I know how much that means to you, right? As a coach, as somebody who has such a deep passion for something and wants to achieve at the highest level, which you're doing, you have to have that. Like it, it I feel like it's, it's really hard if you don't have that integration it's of work and family together. And, um, uh, yeah, like I said, my, my daughter, she loves coming to the office. She knows when I go here that I love to do it. She doesn't think I go to the office because I'm, I don't tell her I need to put food on the table right, and, right. and yep. I have to work. Daddy has to make money. Yep. No, no, daddy goes to work because he loves it. Yep. Daddy loves work. Yeah, daddy loves work. Can I go to the office? Yeah, baby, you can come to the office. Right. 
and she loves coming to the office. So it's that 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 same mindset. Like this is just what our fam- this is what the Nicola family does. Right. Like we we find a way to provide and we find a way to 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 give back and have impact. So I love I love your answer there. But I learned that from people way smarter than me. That was not my idea. Mm-hmm. Um, so well, we I always steal that. something from everybody, right? I mean, yeah. we don't have an original thought. Yeah, exactly, right. exactly. Um, I, man, I, again, I could talk for a long time with you, Coach. Like I said, this is a huge honor for me because um, <clears throat> I think I'm probably I would I would. You put me in a room with the most proud Bulldogs that there are. I, I promise you I'm walking out as the most proud awesome. Crown Point Bulldog there is, man. I freaking love this town. There was a short period of time where I was city. I can't say that. It's a city. Uh, they'll get upset if you call it. Right. Uh, but I'm being born and raised at St. Anthony's and living and growing up here. Um uh, it's so cool to see this. But the energy that Friday night brings in a town is so important. And we have almost never had that. Besides, I remember a three, two, three-year period when I was, you know, younger. Maybe I, that was, Yeah. But now it's so cool to see that uh, and to see how excited everyone is. And it doesn't just require going to a state championship. Like you said, it was like that before we got to a state championship Correct. from what you've done. So yep. um, thank you for what you've done. And, and I'm watching just to learn how to be a better leader. And because I really appreciate what you're doing, and um, yeah, I'm, we're everyone in Crown Point and North Virginia is grateful for that. Well, so thank you for coming. Thanks for sitting with me. Yeah, the pleasure's all mine. Thanks yeah. for having me, yeah. and we'll, we'll I'll come and talk anytime you want to talk about Crown Point football. Absolutely. Thanks, Coach. My pleasure. Appreciate it.